Well, listen, I, I need to make this announcement because we've been talking about man camp, and that's coming up in just two weeks. And so a number of you have signed up, and you're probably wanting more information. That's my fault. I'm the information blockage. So anyway, I have some information for you, and I would love to talk with you after after church today uh, between services or after the second service and make sure you get that information. I apologize for not disseminating it more quickly, but we have everything uh, lining up for you. And so I'm excited about going up to the mountain, the mountain of the Lord for a few days with you to pray and be with some other men and just hear what God's saying to us. Really asking God to infuse, supernaturally infuse uh, the men of this church with, with life and hope and encouragement. And so we've been praying over this for some time, and I believe that it absolutely is going to be a, a great time. And so please, if you haven't signed up, there's a sign-up sheet out front. There's also, you can sign up online. Please let us know who you are. We'd love to make it uh, possible for you to be with us on that trip. So um, this year, we, we had some questions about some of the things we wanted to do for missions and it's just been interesting how God has shown up and helped us and we thought it was going to be a year where we had to hold back some things but God has just been blessing and this year we're actually sending out more mission teams than uh, we have in previous years. We've done a lot of things around the globe. As you see our map over here and our church planting map over here, uh, we're obviously constantly involved in sending the gospel to various locations and sending individuals. This year, we actually have, and let me count now, we have a team going out to Cuba uh, next week. We have a team going to Honduras the month after that. We have a team going to Romania the month after that. And then the first of the year, we have a team going to the Philippines. That's four teams going out from this house to do ministry in some vital places to bring encouragement, to bring the gospel, to bring all kinds of help to Cuba with uh, water filters and just different things that God's doing. And so could you just say with me, thank you, Jesus, that we're able to do beyond, far beyond what we think we can do. It's never about us. It's always about him. And we'll be praying for some of those folks in the second service. If you'd like to hang around and be a part of that, God is really giving us the opportunity to make a difference in the world. And I believe I believe this series of messages that I'm sharing with you right now, we've entitled it Collide, and the idea is that in this world there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God that we're a part of, but then there's the kingdom of this world and the world views that, that underpin both of those or that cause, that, that, that create the foci for both of those world views or those, uh, those kingdoms are absolutely colliding. They, they contradict one another in many ways. And uh, as we approach this election year, uh, there's some things that we need to think about, pray about, talk about, and uh, not be ignorant about. And I don't know about you, but I've often stood in the booth and said, I don't know any of these people. Oh, that person looks as good as... I mean, you know, that's just not the best way to approach voting. And we'll talk some more about that today. This is not a political sermon. I want to talk to you about our responsibility as kingdom men and women. This is not a message that endorses elephants or endorses donkeys. This is a message that endorses the kingdom of God and how God functions or how he wants us to function in this world. The scripture says for us to pray always for those in authority over us that we might live peaceable lives. Scripture from Genesis all the way through reminds us over and over again that God raises up authorities and places us over us. Now, just to be honest and just to, to, to give you some historical insight, we live in the most peaceful time for the church that there's ever been, and yet there are more martyrs today than any other time in life. The church Though we may sometimes feel like someone doesn't like us or cancels us or, you know, kind of tries to hold us back, the reality is, especially in the country we live in, we have incredible religious freedoms. Unfortunately, unfortunately, sometimes freedom does not help us be free. In fact, sometimes we neglect the freedoms that God has given us and we neglect the responsibility that God's given us and we find ourselves in difficulties. So this morning, I want to kind of talk about some of that. Some of this will be review. We've been talking all the way 
Since January, we went to Genesis in January and talked about how God set things in order and how our worldview, really from Genesis 1 to 11, God lays out for us how mankind is supposed to function. He answers many of the questions that we're facing today. But unfortunately, there's lots of voices, lots of voices that are speaking to us and lots of influences. And if you grew up like I did, in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and in the no hundreds and, and now in the 20s. I mean, I'm still growing up. I haven't reached my maximum growth yet, thank God. But, but here's the reality. We've been listening to, we've been indoctrinated in some areas for a long, long time. Can you say amen? amen. And those things that we've been indoctrinated, those things that we've accepted as being science or truth, uh, which may not have may not have scientific backing or may not actually have the truth behind them. You see, we often accept facts as truth, and, you know, facts are not truth always. But because of that, we, we look through a lens that has been tainted, and that's why we need the Word of God, and, and, and that's why we need this message today. I've entitled it, Be Transformed, and I'm going to take my opening text from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and this text, Paul, the apostle, is speaking. He's writing. He's in prison. He's writing to the church. Uh, he's writing to the Romans, and he's talking to them. There's Christians in Rome. These are Jews that have now in Rome that have become Christ followers, and also non-Jews, uh, Gentiles that have become Christ followers. And he's talking to them about the way that they view life. He's talking to them about understanding that however you lived before Christ affects you, and it affects your understanding and interpretation of things. But now that you've come into Christ, you have to have your mind transformed, mind renewed, because you cannot see or act the way you used to act. Now, this is important because the Apostle Paul, before he met Christ on the road to uh, Damascus, he actually was, though a, a, a devout Jew, a, a lawyer, uh, a, a doctor of the, of the Judaism, he was persecuting and attempting to crush the way, the movement that had erupted on the day of Pentecost after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was determined to squelch it, to crush it, if it, mean, if it meant killing, if it meant taking children, if it, whatever it meant. By any means, he had received authority to do that. And God, by His Spirit, met him on the road to Damascus and said, um, excuse me, why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this? And Paul, who, listen to this now, Paul was, he was sincere. Zeal was driving him. He really wanted to protect the message of Judaism. He wanted to protect the covenants. He wanted to protect. There's no indication that he was wrongheaded other than he didn't understand. He had not met Christ. He didn't understand the truth. And God, in His mercy, met him as he was traveling to export his persecution and said, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? He's realizing that he's having an angelic visitation. This is in Acts chapter 9, by the way. And the Lord said, it is I, Jesus, that you're persecuting. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been those moments in my life where I just knew I knew that I knew that I knew. You ever knew that you knew that you knew that you knew until then suddenly you realize, that's not what I, that was wrong. <laughs> now, that's not happened often to me, Ray, but it's happened once in a while. My wife tells me it's a lot more than I realize, but I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, anyway, yeah, you understand. And so in that moment, God radically begins transforming him. In fact, the Bible says that immediately he was blind. And that after he, someone prayed for him, a prophet prayed for him, scales fell from his eyes. And as the scales fell from his eyes, he saw more clearly and more perfectly and understood from the Hebrew Scriptures, the law, all that God was doing. 
And his mind and his heart was transformed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and become one of the most powerful. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, and you and I received the message of grace because of him. Now, he is writing to the church in Rome, but this church is a circular letter, so it's going to go to many people. It comes to us, and in Romans chapter 1, chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, that is all that he's done for you, all the things that you've experienced, that you should offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, just realize that everything you are and ever will be, that is God's gift to you, and what you do with it is your gift to God as you give your life to him, serving him holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, verse 2, and this is what's in your handout. By the way, if you did not pick up a handout when you came through, please raise your hand. We have some folks who will get those to you right away. These are important for two reasons. Not only does it keep me on track and hopefully you with me, but on the back there are lots of resources that will help you as you think through how you're supposed to vote and also there are prayer points that we're covering this week in prayer. So please raise your hand and take advantage of those and utilize them. So Paul goes on now to say this. He says, do not be conformed. This word conformed was probably one of the first words that I studied as a young Christ follower. I was teaching a bunch of other young Christ followers and See, the thing about being a Bible teacher is you only have to be a few steps ahead of everybody else and you're the expert in the room. Barely saved, but God entrusted me with some young teenagers that I led to Christ from my high school. And and this word conform stuck out to me. It was one of the first messages that I shared. And God gave me an image, and I remember using a visual because you use visuals with teenagers. It helps them. And so I I took a jello mold. How many of you remember those jello molds? Remember the ones that looked like lobsters that hung on the wall in the kitchen? I took one of those and I'd mixed up some jello. And at the beginning of our my talk with these young men and women, I poured that orange jello or red jello into that copper mold and we set it aside in some in some ice in an ice bucket and everybody knew that at the end of the meeting we were going to have jello that's what it was all about they didn't care they didn't catch anything else but suddenly I began to unpack this idea of being conformed and here's the reality Paul's saying listen don't be poured into the mold the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of of your mind. You see, today there's all kind of pressures, there's all kind of restraints, there's all kind of fears, there's all kind of things that kind of force us into a way of thinking or cause us to say or not say or do or not do. In fact, it makes us question many times all the things that we've ever believed or ever understood. Paul goes on to say, don't be transformed, don't be poured into the mold of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what is the will of God, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How many of you have felt in your life there are some areas where the pressure, peer pressure, local pressure, even in your marriage, just to keep peace, You've kind of felt forced into a mold that may be different. Now, I'm not talking about the, in the good ways, like someone you know, telling you you need to lose weight. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone forcing you or inviting you into a decision that is contrary to God's Word. You felt maybe you couldn't say something. Maybe you needed to hold your tongue. Maybe you just needed to, well... I don't need to say more. I think you get it. So the enemy, the world, will press us into a different kind of mindset. In fact, Jesus, after he was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, he went up into the wilderness. The Spirit of the Lord led him into the wilderness. And there, 40 days, he fasted, he prayed, he spent time 
with the Father getting a download from heaven on who he was and what he was to do and how he was to go forward. And undoubtedly there was a plan unfolding in him for calling men to follow him, disciples, men and women whom he would pour his life into and see them transformed rather than conform to the world that they lived in. And then the enemy came just as he was hungry and tired and about to end his time in the wilderness And the enemy began tempting him and questioning the very words of God. If you're the Son of God, if you're really the Son of God, do it this way. If you're really the Son of God, do it that way. If you'll just worship me, O Son of God, I'll give you the whole world. You'll never have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer. I'll make it all yours. Just bow down right now and confess that I'm the Lord of this world, and I'll be happy to turn it over to you. And Jesus would not be conformed. He would not compromise because he understood the economy of heaven. You and I sometimes miss that, that we are placed on this earth not to be happy, but to be holy. And in that holiness, we will find fulfillment in him. But see, the world will try to tell you happiness is summed up by what you own or what you get to do or what you get. But God would say to you today, Listen, true happiness is walking with me and being a part of this eternal kingdom and seeing the transformation, the deliverance, the breakthroughs for those that I'm sending into your path. Back in July, we started a series called Summer in the Psalms. The first message out of that gate was my own. In fact, it was the only sermon that I preached. had some great communicators share the Word of God with you in June and July. And uh, it was a tremendous time, or July and August, actually. But the first message that I shared with you out of that series came from Psalm chapter 1. And I want to take you back there just for a moment in your mind with this question, who is calling the cadence of your life? Don't be transformed. Don't be conformed to this world. And then here, the psalmist David says this. He says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or take or, or, take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. So the question I want you to answer, and you can fill in that blank, who's calling the cadence of your life? Who are you walking in step with? Now, you're you're thinking, what does this have to do with, I thought you were talking about collision, collide, you're talking about elections, you're talking about the issues that we're facing as a nation. Yes, I am, because someone, listen, someone is feeding you, somewhere you are gleaning information and making decisions that will affect how you function and how you respond when the curtains pulled and you're standing in front of that ballot box with the sacred trust I believe it's a sacred trust of God to help guide this nation we have been given this opportunity many nations do not have that opportunity how will you vote will you stand informed or will you simply play that childhood game hot potato hot potato (laughs) eeny meeny miny mo will you simply play roulette with your ink pen, you know, oh God, help me choose, boom. (laughs) And that is not the way that you and I need to function. Who's calling cadence for you? Paul says it's this world is trying to conform you. John, the apostle, said that The world, the flesh, the devil, they beckon you. They're seeking to influence you. James said, if you lack wisdom, ask God. And so many times we wait until we get into the booth. I'm being honest, and I'm I'm telling you this because we've got 60 days. And many of you will vote early, and so you have less than 60 days. I don't... It's not my, de- it's not my de- determination or not my purpose to tell you who to vote for or how to vote for, but that when you vote, vote by faith and not by fear. Is that all right? I don't like preaching these kind of sermons. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't like talking about these things in the house of the Lord, but they must be talked about in the house of the Lord because we have a sacred responsibility. Amen. And if we do nothing... Do we have no excuse on the other side to 
to bellyache or whine or complain. No, no matter, listen, no matter who ends up sitting at the top of the heap, listen to me, no matter who ends up sitting at the top of the heap, you and I have a God-given responsibility to say, Lord, you raise up and you put down. Today you have raised this person up. We're going to pray for them because they will make decisions that will not only affect us, but our children and our children's children. So you cannot take this lightly. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for several amens and lots of nods. I'm trusting those were nods of affirmation and not. <laughs> so who's calling your cadence? Where are you, how are you formulating your steps, not only to walk before the Lord? Are you walking in relationship? Are you building relationships within the community of believers? Or are you, you know, I don't really need people. I'm kind of like an introvert or extrovert or whatever kind of vert. I'm out here hanging out and I need church once. You need the church. Christ commanded us to come together. Paul said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because together not to tell each other how to vote, but together we pray, together we seek His face, together we encourage, together we correct, together we stand and build a future for our children and for our great-grandchildren. Who's calling the cadence in your life? When Jesus was faced with questions about cultural issues. When Jesus was questioned about marriage and divorce, he, he didn't give his opinion. He went straight back to Genesis and said, in the beginning. <laughs> That's number two in your notes. In the beginning. In the beginning. This is the way God intended it. We may have diverted or, or diverged from where God intended us to be, but from the beginning, this is the way. In fact, over and over and over again, Two-thirds of the times when Jesus answered or responded to a question, he said, what did the prophet say? What have you read in Scripture? What does the Bible tell you? In the beginning, Jesus said it in Matthew 19. He answered when they said, ask him about divorce. He says, have you not read that he who made them, male and female, from the beginning... He made them male and female, and he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. In the notes there, I've just given you some other supplemental verses that basically just reinforce exactly what Jesus said over and over. And there are many, many more. I just gave you a few. So understanding that God says that the Bible is our handbook, as we embrace the Scripture and we say we can understand God's will because He's revealed it to us, then we must understand that we have an obligation to read His Word. To read, the, we've talked about this since January of this year and last year as well. Reading God's Scripture is not something that you can possibly do. Think about doing As a man or woman who says, I trust Christ, reading the Scripture is number one. Immersing yourself in the Bible. That does not mean driving down the road and listening to audible.com, someone reading the Bible to you, and you are singing your favorite song in one head, listening to the children in another head. You're not even engaging with the Word. As men and women, if you're going to grow in Christ, if your mind's going to be renewed by God's Word, you've got to read, reflect, think, and talk about Scripture. That's a good place for someone to say amen. Thank you. <laughs> or you could say, oh, me. Not only do we read Scripture, but then the Bible says if you lack wisdom, ask. Last week we talked about Jesus. He said, ask, seek, knock, and you shall find. If you need wisdom on any issue of life, any problem that you're facing, any of the things that are coming at us, even as we face the elections. The things, it's not the person, don't get enamored. Not that there's much to get enamored with these days. But listen, don't get enamored and think this one or that one. Do not look at the, whether they're tall or short or whether they're elo eloquent or not. Listen to me. You need to look to the Lord. 
Because man is not your salvation, God is. He will use a man or a woman. He will use a human individual to sit in that seat and help make decisions. But you need to know that you did all you could do to pray and be engaged in the process because that's a gift from God. And so you go to God. You ask for wisdom. Lord, how do I handle this thing? Because listen, the choices that we have, however you feel about them, they all have feet of clay. They all have feet of clay. They all have been caught in lies. They've all been caught in character issues. So let's not think one is more righteous than the other. Everyone, listen, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I am telling you, don't look and be enamored by politics. Get on your face before God and ask him, Lord, what do we do? Because there is no simple answer. I guess really quiet. But I'm just being honest with you. There is no simple answer. But God has a plan. I mentioned to you that the Scripture offers us, just as Jesus said, go to the, what does the Scripture say? What, is, what have I said from the beginning? I want you to look at number three, and I want you to understand that when we talk about the Bible being our handbook, the reality of it being our handbook is that it is also, it has laid for us both our moral and our ethical, our spiritual code of life is found right here. And so every area that we're going to face, and I'm going to touch on just a few real quickly. Uh, I'm going to give you five real quickly. These are issues that are going to come to play in this current election. And you need to be aware what the answer God has, not what the cu culture has. Am I meddling with you? Number one, religious freedom. You may not think it's, you may think, well, the Constitution protects it. Religious freedom is under fire all the time. Whenever they attack the Scripture, whenever they, when they took prayer from school, that doesn't bother me that they took prayer from school because prayer in school that is just rote practice is not prayer. When they took the Bible out of school, that doesn't bother me if all they were doing was holding a book and it was just a book of fables. But when they refuse to let men and women read the Bible, when they refuse to let men and women let God's Word be the sole foundation of our choice, that impinges on our religious freedom. But I want you to see that all the way from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God established Himself as the God of heaven and invited us into a worship experience to live with Him and for Him. Genesis chapter 1, 1, in the beginning God. And God has given us in America, in our great country, and in many other nations as well, but in our great nation, we have constitutionally, our constitution, all of our bylaws, all of, all, all of the Bill of Rights are all based on what God says about man and man's abilities and man's need for justice and how we should treat one another. We've never fulfilled it and done well with it, but God gave our founding fathers wisdom, moved on their hearts, though not all were Christ followers, not all, some were deists, some were theists, some were atheists, but they all believed God's principles, God's word was core and trustworthy. So Genesis becomes our moral and ethical compass, and when it comes to religious freedom, which is on the ballot this year, you need to know God said you have this freedom. God established this, and you need to watch, and you need to think, and you need to be discerning what is it that's coming against our religious freedom. How will this individual, and it won't be one law, it won't be one individual, but it'll be an entire movement, and so you need to recognize what parties talking about and what, what planks they put in their party platform, and what happens overall when we go this direction, and I I, I'm telling you that as you look at these things, some of it will be clear, not all of it will be clear, but you need to wisely ask for God's wisdom. Number two, sanctity of human life. Now, I'm not just talking about the life of the unborn. I'm talking about human life, period. God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our own image. And throughout Scripture, other than, other than how we deal with God, God spoke more about how we deal with one another. In fact, 
Five, ten, ten of the great commandments. Five was how we relate to God, and five was how we relate to one another. In fact, Jesus said the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, and the second is like this. Just like it, he says, love your neighbor as your sanctity of human life. We're not just talking about the unborn, though that is vital. We, we saw Roe versus Wade reversed, and now it's in the hands of the states. We need to pray. We need to pray that God would give state rulers wisdom. Already, there are some that are going to the extreme. Babies could be aborted after birth. That's simply murder. Others that say babies can't be aborted at all. We need to have God's wisdom on this. I believe in life. And I believe it's important not only for infants, the unborn, but I believe it's for the, important for the infirm as well. I believe it's important for those of us who are reaching our golden years and may not be able to do as much as we used to do. I believe it's important for those that are sick and having difficulties. I believe it's important and we need to vote accordingly because people are looking for ways to call, <laughs> to call out the weak. I'm not trying to be divisive with this. I'm just trying to be honest. Help you to see. Help you to think. These things are what you are voting for. Gender and sexuality also found in Scripture. He made man, he made them male and female. From the beginning, it was XX and XY. From the beginning. And in fact, up to COVID, it was always XX and XY. We trusted the science somehow during COVID, did we not? And now suddenly the science is called into question, and there's a bigger range. It's, and listen, I'm not going to go down that route because I don't want to offend anyone, but I also don't want to play into the talking points of this world. What I need you to understand is that God made you the way you are. And there are, on rare occasions, 1.7% of all babies born in the earth have what's called an intersexual uh, they're called intersex. They have both male and female organs. I ran into this many times in China. Kids that were in the orphanages often would have both male and female, and they would have to make a choice based on the internal organs, whether they had a, a womb and whether they had ovaries or whether they had testes. I'm just being honest with you. And a decision had to be made by parents as to whether they would be George or Georgiana. That happens. Unfortunately, it happens. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where our DNA allows things to happen because sin has been affecting our DNA and cancers come into our bodies. Radical cells hit our bodies. Death is at work in our bodies because of sin. But thanks be unto God, sin shall not triumph. Death shall not triumph. For me to die, it's going to be tough on y'all. Y'all got to figure out where to lay me down. But here's the truth. I ain't going to be worried about it. I'm going to be with the Lord in heaven. And I pray that none of you ever have that responsibility. May the Lord shout and may we all meet him in the air. Amen. But we honestly know that days will come. So the Bible talks about sexuality. This is not a matter of, well, he said, she said. This is not a matter of, well, you know, things have changed. And it's never changed. It's never changed. Now, pressure is on everyone. And my son came from Romania. He was teaching in school. And the kids recognized that he was a little gullible. He had not been in America for 10 years. And, and he was teaching school. And so they walk up to him one day. My name is John. The next day, my name is Jean. Today I'm a boy and tomorrow I'm a girl. It drove him crazy. He didn't know what to do. And, and, of course, he was under great pressure, so he just simply had to step out of the academic world, education world. And uh, he loved those kids, but he could not, could not wrestle with that daily. It just was impossible to win. And this is happening everywhere. But you need to understand that's on the ballot box. That's on the ballot, and if you don't vote, then don't whine and complain later and say somebody ought to do something because you had your shot. And if you do vote and it doesn't turn out the way that you expected, don't whine and complain again. Just simply continue to pray because God raises up, God puts down. And God can move men and move women even as he moves mountains and the truth is we do not live in a Christian nation. We live in a nation that was Christian, built on Christian principles, but it is not the four. We, we do not have the high ground in every area. Another area that we might find on our ballot box would be the area of education. And I'm not 
There are lots of different ways to talk about this. My, my wife and I, we both home educated our children and we put them in public school and we put them in, in private school. We did all kinds of things, whatever it took at that moment to help them get through, but we never took our hands off the tiller. In other words, someone else may be teaching them biology, but you can believe mom and dad are going to be right in the midst of it, answering questions, talking about with them, and walking through God's Word and understanding it. If you think you can turn your kids over to strangers for eight to ten hours a day and not get a mess, you are in need of wisdom. Parenting, listen, parenting engages children in formative conversation, teaches them right from wrong, teaches them to know God, to trust God, and to follow God, but also helps them make decisions based on truth, not based on fishy facts. You like that? Fishy facts. I like that. I just made that up. All right. One more, one more, uh, marriage, family, and society. <clears throat> All the way back, Gen we have not even got out of the first chapter of Genesis, but Genesis 1 through 11 lays it out, the penalty of sin, the need for atonement. All those things are laid out for us in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. We could just see that over and over and over again. But if you never read it, if you never think about it, if you never reflect on this, then you'll miss it, and you could even dismiss it as being ancient and out of fashion, et cetera, et cetera, and you'll just be given over to the gods of this world in your decision making. So marriage, family, and how we act in society. Well, God said to, to uh, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And he gave, them, he gave them a code of ethics of how to work. And he put boundaries in their lives and said, don't do these things and do these things. And, and be fruitful as you have children and multiply. Teach them. In fact, in Genesis chapter 4, we find the first murder which took place after the sons of, uh, Cain, uh, of, of, of uh, what was their name? Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Adam and Eve taught their children how to worship God. They were bringing their sacrifices, their offering to God. And Cain got a little upset with Abel because Abel did it God's way and Cain did it his own way. Be fruitful and multiply. Marriage, you know, it's just a reality, brothers and sisters. You can, you can hate it, you can deny it, you can, you can say what you want. But in the nation of the United States, in our country, men and women have a a constitutional right now to choose their partner based on love, not based on sexuality, based on gender. That's something that could change. I don't know. It's not something that I'm going to fight against or, or build. You know, I'm not going to die on that hill. What I'm going to die on is a hill that says, listen, Jesus died for every person. I may not be able to condone. I may not be able to accept. I will not perform a marriage. I cannot, by the word of God, between the same sexes. That's not what I'm going to do. They can go anywhere else. They can go many different places. I can't stop that. That's their legal right. But I want you to know and hear me, hear my heart. Just because you do something that's legally right doesn't mean it's right before God. Just because you do something that's legally right does not mean that you're righteous. It also doesn't mean that that gives me an opportunity to then lambast and go after a person and attack their lifestyle. What it says to me is that, listen, God loved me when I was a mess. And had it not been for His grace, I might have been in a different kind of marital situation, or I might have had five or six or seven marriages, or I might not have ever married anybody, just slept with whoever I wanted to, because that's what the fallen nature of man does. But in the grace of God, in the mercy of God, He delivered me from sexual sin. Can you say amen? He delivered me, and listen, if you were engaged or had been engaged in any of that, God forgave you when He came to you. They are not worse than you. You are not better than anyone else. But listen, it is God's mercy and grace that calls us unto repentance. You've heard me say this a dozen times, and I'm going to say it a dozen more times this week, month. God calls you to come to Him as you are, just as you are, broken, in sin, desperate, confused. But He doesn't call you to stay the way you are. He calls you that he might restore you to his purpose for your life. Jesus paid it all. Now, that's a song, and songs can be bad theology from time to time. You've probably figured that out. But that's a song that is well-founded in the truth of the atonement. Jesus paid it all. He paid everything for you, no matter what your sin. 
He paid everything for me, no matter what my sin. In fact, I never have to look at you and wonder, well, I wonder what they did. I wonder if they're worthy, because you were not. You were not worthy. And all the stuff that the enemy has, you know, helped you lug along in your life, all those boxes and things, that luggage that you've been carrying, you've been lugging around, all of your sin, all of your shame, all of your fear, I want you to know that Jesus Christ, he said, if you will bring that burden to me, I'll take it. Cast your cares on me because I care for you. Jesus took upon himself the sin of the world. That includes every vile thing you ever did or thought. But it also includes the vile things that others have done and thought. They may not realize it yet. In fact, that's the thing I think might break the heart of God more than anything else is that many will walk into a devil, devil's hell, a godless eternity, when all the time he was saying, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden. Come to me. And many will not for fear that he'll try to control them. Many will not for fear that he'll try to make them miserable and force them to do something they don't want to do. He won't force them to do anything. If you don't want to come, that's your choice. You choose. But you and I have choices to make as well. Are you still with me? Let me finish this message up. So I've talked about religious freedom, sanctity of life, gender, and sexuality. I've talked about education. I've talked about family, marriage, family, society, all these different things. They're going to be on the ballot box. They're going to be listed in with some of them will be very bold and say, here's what I believe about this. In fact, I went to both uh, party platforms and I was kind of amazed that some party platforms have not even stated what they're about yet. And yet we're still only 60 days away. And they're not saying this is, this is our policy, this is our platform. It's all very fluid. In other words, if we win, we'll figure it out. Boys and girls, we need to figure it out before. And we need to pray and act accordingly. Because, and this is number four in your handout. I said this last week, and I really believe that when I wrote it, it, it had a, I had a sense that God was whispering in my ear that God, America is God's gift to us. It's not perfect. Lord, we're not perfect. We are a long way from it. But it's God's gift to us. His light through us is our gift to the world. Many nations look to us. And if we say yes, they say yes. And we, if, we, if we can raise the light, if we can be the city set on the hill, if the church can be who we're called to be, listen, we can have an influence far beyond our borders but we must have an influence in our borders before anything else. Three points, and then I'm going to close. I said this to you last week. Prayer is our, prayer for our leaders is what it should say. Prayer for our leaders is our Christian responsibility. It's not an option. Pray for those in authority over you. I fail sometime, but I'll tell you, I prayed more for President Biden. I prayed more for President Trump. And I'll continue to pray for all those that are, that are elected, all those that are in leadership, because they will make decisions that will impact, may not even impact me, but i got grandkids. And if I've got grandkids, I've got potential great-grandkids. I may not be around, but listen, they will be. I want them to inherit a blessing and not a stressing. Are you with me? These are two things that I really felt the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear today. That is, be in your notes, voting is an act of stewardship. Voting is an act of stewardship. It's like taking care of your grass, taking care of your house, taking care of your marriage, putting money in savings, paying off your bills. It's being a responsible individual. Voting is a matter of stewardship. And this really rang, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say this is Bible, but I'm saying I really felt like Holy Spirit spoke this to Tommy as he was praying and as he was thinking in, for months now about this message, and that is this, that prayerful and informed voting. I need to put the word voting in there. Informed voting is an act of worship. What do I mean by that? It means that when I've prayed and I've sought God and I've, I've done my homework and I'm not just going to throw darts at the board and hope something sticks. No, when I've actually sought the Lord and said, God, what can I do? And then 
by conviction, through my convictions, I vote my conscience, I vote what I believe, I see right from God, and, and I move forward. And it may all, not all be in the one party or another party. It may be mixed, but here's the reality. When I, when I am prayerful, God give me wisdom, and I'm informed, and I go in and vote, then I'm actually offering God worship. It's an act of faith. God, I can't control the outcome, but I can control my portion. I'm casting my vote. I'm casting my vote in confidence, in confidence that I've done my part. See, some of you stay home. Some of you have already made a decision. Well, I'm old. It doesn't really matter. Or you say, you know, it... There's no real good choice. I'm just not going to get bothered. Or you haven't thought about it. You haven't gotten registered. I mean, you're just not going to be a part. Listen, that's the quickest way to give it all away. Just let everybody, let somebody else make all the decisions. And I promise you, you have a part to play. So please, take this seriously. Seek the Lord. Ask Him for wisdom. It's not a religious duty. It's not like we have to or sin. But it is our responsibility to care for those around us. It is our responsibility to seek God's wisdom and to do what only we can do. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I want to say thank you. I love you, and I'm grateful to you, and I, I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would use this message to huh, provoke, inspire, move us. Father, I, I have no desire to tell people who to vote for. I just have a desire to help them understand the importance of their contribution and the need to seek your face for wisdom and to know what they know. So Jesus, help us, I pray. Father, I pray for this election. I pray that it would go without interference. I pray in Jesus' name that it would be clear. I pray in Jesus' name God, that you would, you would undertake for us here in the nation of the United States and that you would help us. God, raise up for us the leaders that we need, not necessarily all the leaders that we want, but raise up those that will make decisions. Sometimes we don't even know what decisions need to be made and, or how to make them. And God, we, we need your wisdom because God, I do believe that you have a plan. Would you bring forth your ambassadors? They may not be the best holy men or women, but God, we pray that there'll be men of character. We pray there'll be men of competency, women of courage in Jesus Christ's name. Would you stand with me? Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for letting me share with you thank you those of you who are online god bless you i hope we got all the the audio stuff worked out i know it must have been challenging i tried to to use my hands so you could tell what i was saying that didn't work <laughs> hope you could read my lips and maybe they were able to transcribe when we were having difficulty but listen if you can hear me now i'm so grateful that you're with us i'm so thankful that even though you can't be in the room with us you are online with us, and we love you and appreciate you. And, of course, there are folks here to pray for you. And you also, listen, you look around, you're going to find some folks with, with one of these tags on. We're all getting lanyards these days. This is the year of lanyards. And so this says, may I pray for you. And if someone's wearing this and you need prayer, go to them. Or you can walk right over here to the cross. There will be ministers over here by the cross. You can always find help at the foot of the cross. Remember that. They'll be there ready to pray for you. They, are, they have been praying all week. For this opportunity and so in jesus name lift your hands i want to bless you and send you out of here father god i love you and i thank you for your people may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord cause his face to shine upon you may the lord be gracious to you and give unto you his peace this week as you fight and wrestle through some of these issues that the world offer let it force you to your knees into your bible and Connect with God. Ask Him. He'll respond. Seek Him. He will be found. Knock and He will give you the wisdom you're looking for so that you can confidently take your next step in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, 
Amen. God bless you. I love you. You're dismissed. Thank you. God bless you. Come to the Lord. Come lay down your burden. Find your rest. You can trust the Father. He's good. And He satisfies. Come to the bread. All of you who hunger never runs out. Can trust the Father, He is good and He satisfies. Say the 